I'm so glad that you are joining us again today for this series on the different names of God in the Old Testament. It's my prayer that you've heard something already if you've been following along with us that you have found to be a blessing and comfort for your life. And I'm confident that the name of God we're going to look at today will be no exception. It is so important for us to study the names of God because as we've said in this series, when we know the different names for God, we begin to know God in different ways. And the more ways that we can know God, the stronger our faith and our relationship with God becomes. I want to begin today by asking you just to, to think about your life and your relationship with God and your understanding of how God has worked in your life. When has God provided for you in a powerful way? It's good for us to slow down and to think about the ways that God has already blessed us, already provided for us, before we ask Him to bless us and provide for us even more. So when has God provided for you, blessed you in a powerful way? Maybe it was with a relationship or with a job or the selling of a house when other houses in your neighborhood weren't selling. Maybe it was with some great friends or obviously your children. The Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord. Well, the name of God that we're going to look at today speaks to God's providential providing nature. The name that we're going to look at today is the name uh, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. And we are entering the section of the series, as the screen says here behind me, where we're going to start focusing on the different compound names of God. And it's interesting to note that the compound names of God appear in Scripture when people are in trouble or when they are afraid. That's where we find them. It's not a coincidence. The great heroes of the Bible cried out to God with His compound names when they were in a real predicament. And that means something for you and for me because if we know what these names are, well, we know when we need to use them. God serves as a source of help or strength when we are in times of trouble, when we are afraid. These compound names for God are always Jehovah, which we looked at just a few weeks ago. Jehovah is the relational name of God. We know we have come across Jehovah when all four letters of the word Lord are capitalized in the English Bible. These compound names of God are Jehovah plus another virtue of His character. And today, like I said, we're going to look at the name Jehovah Jireh, which roughly translated means the Lord will provide. And maybe one of the most famous episodes that we see in Scripture of God's providential hand is the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. If you are at home and if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to go ahead and open your Bibles to Genesis 22 or open that passage up on your tablet where you look at Scripture. Obviously, you can follow along with me on the TV screen behind me. But what do you know already about the story of Abraham being asked by God to sacrifice his child of promise named Isaac. It's fascinating to me that within the grand scheme of history, when you study subjects like Western civilization, even people who are not Christians or God-fearing individuals are familiar with this story of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac. They look at it as a fascinating piece of literature or a very interesting piece of history. Even if they don't resonate with the faith message behind the story, most people are familiar with this story. And if I were to guess, you're probably familiar with the story as well. What do you know about it already? 
I mean, we could talk about it from so many different ways, with many different angles. We could take note of the fact that there are so many symbolisms in Scripture between Isaac and Jesus. Isaac carries the wood for the sacrifice. Jesus carries the wood for the cross. Isaac is this child of promise, the one and only son of Abraham, whom Abraham loves dearly. Jesus is the one and only begotten son of the Father. And we know from the New Testament that God will say at least two times from heaven, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Many historians say that Isaac is probably in his mid to late 20s in this story. We know that Jesus was the age of 33 when he was crucified. It's kind of been our habit in biblical teaching to kind of look at Isaac as a young lad, but that's probably not correct. If he's old enough to carry the wood and old enough to know that something's not adding up here, that the wood is there and the knife is there and they're on the way to make sacrifice, but the animal's missing, most seven, eight, nine-year-olds would not comprehend that. But there's so many different things about this story that are worth discussing. But today, what I want us to focus on are the providential qualities of God that we see in this story and why they rise to the surface. I think it's only appropriate to begin by talking about trials. Because in Abraham's life, which spans from Genesis chapter 13 to Genesis chapter 25, this is probably his greatest trial. Now, he faced the burning of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He watched Lot's wife die because she turned around and looked back on the cities when God told them not to do that. Abraham saw battles. He saw gains. He saw losses. But this story in Genesis 22 is probably his greatest trial. And when we think about the trials of life, we remember some important factors about trials. One being that they are unavoidable. I think it's fair to say that we're either in a trial right now, we have just escaped a trial, or I don't want to be the bearer of bad news for you today, but there's probably another trial on the way. Trials are just a part of life. That is why James, the brother of Jesus, would say at the very beginning of his book about practical Christian living, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. It is important for us to note in that passage that nowhere in there does James use the word if. James uses the word when. James says when trials come, you can find joy in those trials because you know that these trials are producing a stronger you when it comes to following after Jesus. Trials are a part of of life. They are unavoidable. And then when we, when we look at Isaac and his role in this story, we see some factors about Isaac as well. One, we know that Abraham loved Isaac. I mean, why would he not? He is Isaac's father. And it's interesting to note, as we've already mentioned, God refers to Isaac as Abraham's son, his one and only son, whom he loves. That is the exact depiction that we find for Jesus in his relationship to the Father. And more than the fact that Abraham loved Isaac, I think it's also fair to say that Abraham needed Isaac. If you recall, God had made a covenant with Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, that he would have as many descendants as there was sand on the seashore and stars in the sky. But Isaac was kind of the glue that held that covenant together. And so Abraham had to think, if I lose Isaac, is this covenant now void? Because the blessing will come through me, passed down 
through Isaac down to Jacob. But if you remove one piece of that puzzle, well, what happens to the covenant? Abraham needed Isaac as much as he loved Isaac. I think it's fair to say in this story that, that God has a question in mind, which is why this episode takes place. God wants to know who Abraham loves more. Does Abraham love the blessing that God has provided, which was Isaac? Or did Abraham love the blesser, God, the one who made it possible? What about us in our lives? Is it possible for us to love the blessing more than the one who blessed us? I think we see it pretty often. It is so easy to say that we love God when our business is doing well, when we've had a record-breaking year, or when our health is strong, when our families are whole. When life is just good, it is so easy to say, man, we love God so much. But what happens when our business files for bankruptcy? What happens when the doctors give us a terrible diagnosis? What happens when our family falls apart, when adultery takes place, when our children leave the Lord? Are we still able to say that we love God just as much as we ever have? Or do we love the blesser because of his blessing? God wants to figure out what's going on in Abraham's life. Do you love the blessing or do you love the blesser more? And unfortunately, it would take a pretty difficult test for God to find his answer. And so let's look at Abraham's faith in this tremendous trial of Genesis chapter 22. I think it's very important for us to note how Abraham responded to what God was asking him to do. There was immediate action on Abraham's part. We read in Genesis chapter 22, verse 3, that early the next morning, Abraham got up. I've, I've highlighted these action verbs in white. Abraham got up. He saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. Abraham did not allow any dust to grow under his feet. When God said to go, Abraham went. And that's one of the reasons why Abraham is remembered as a hero of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 was because of his tremendous action, which was spurred on by his faith in God. There was no negotiation. There was no bargaining. There was no pleading for God to change his mind. God said, do it. Abraham did it. I think an interesting question would be, is delayed obedience disobedience? How would you answer that question? Is delayed obedience disobedience? Hmm. Well, in this case, because Abraham was immediate, it was certainly obedience. There's not always a black and white answer. You, you remember Jesus told a parable about two workers in a vineyard. The master told his workers to go and do such and such. One worker said, I'm not going to do it. And then later on that day, he eventually did. One worker said, okay, I'll go get it done. And then he never finished the job. Jesus asked the question, which servant was righteous? And his answer was the one who actually went and did what the master told him to do. There was a delay, but at least he followed through. But I think many times in our lives, when we delay doing what God has asked us to do, we never get it done. Can you imagine how hard it would have been for Abraham to go and take on this challenge, which we know he did not want to do, 
if he hadn't done it immediately? James, the brother of Jesus, once again, he joins in the song and he gives us his perception, his answer to this question. Is delayed obedience disobedience? Well, James says in James 4, 17, anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, he sins. So James would kind of indicate, yeah, yeah, delayed obedience may be disobedience. No one can ever say that Abraham delayed obeying God. And then we see Abraham's total confidence in God's provision. Very early on in the story, in Genesis 22, once they arrive at Mount Moriah, where the sacrifice will take place, Abraham says to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then notice we, Abraham and Isaac, we will come back to you. Tremendous faith. Now some kind of kick this to the side and ignore it and say, well, what else was Abraham going to say with Isaac listening? I need to go murder my son and then I'll come right back? Of course he's going to say we're going to come right back. I, I don't choose to believe that. That's an easy out. I think Abraham says, we're going to come back to you because Abraham believed both he and his son were going to come back to the servants. Abraham believed that in one way or another, God was going to figure this out. Now, Abraham had seen a miracle in the fact that Isaac was born at the age of 100 years old. Abraham had never seen a resurrection. But Abraham had the faith to believe that in one way or another, God was going to make sense of this confusing, heartbreaking task. That's why the writer of Hebrews gives us a little bit more information, kind of pulls back the curtain a little bit more so we can see deeper into Abraham's heart when the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews eleven nineteen 19, that Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham was confident in the God who would provide for him. And so God responds to Abraham and his tremendous faith. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 12, God says, Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son, again calling your attention, to the similar way that Jesus is described in the Gospel accounts. I've often wondered if God really is omniscient, if God really is all-knowing, how did God not already know that Abraham feared God? Because God's wording is, now I know. Now I know. Well, if that's true, God's pretty difficult to convince. God in Genesis 12 tells an 80-year-old Abraham, you need to pick up and leave everything and go where I tell you to go. I'm not telling you where. I just want you to go where I direct you. Abraham goes. Abraham deals with the problems in his family with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham hears God tell him, you're going to have a son, and Abraham has to wait 30 years before that promise actually comes to fruition. Well, 25 years. So, how does God not already know that Abraham fears God, especially if God is the all-knowing, omniscient God who's supposed to know everything? Either He's omniscient or He's not. <coughs> well, I don't think that's what's going on here, and I hope you don't either. Now, some scholars will bring this up and they will question the omniscient nature of God because of this statement. Here's what I think God is saying. I know it intellectually. I know on paper. I know that you've told me that you love me, but I want to experience it emotionally. I want to feel your love for me. I want to know that it's real. 
I read the other day in studying for my uh, doctoral program, this scholar made the point, you know, Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus never told anyone that He loved them. Why did Jesus never use the words, I love you? Well, that's because Jesus didn't have to say it for people to know it. Jesus lived it. The closest we get to it is when Jesus says that God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. But Jesus in the New Testament never looks at anyone that He heals or that He's teaching or that He's visiting with and says, I love you, because they knew it. He proved it through His actions. God is wanting Abraham to prove through his actions once again that he fears God. We're the same way in our human relationships. We don't want people just to tell us that they love us. We want to experience them loving us. We want to feel nurtured. We want to feel cared for. We want to feel protected. We want to feel like a priority. We want to feel a connection. We want to feel transparency. We want to feel honesty and constant open dialogue. Then we know that they love us. Remember, we're created in the image of God. We feel what He feels. And Jesus came to earth to feel what we feel on this planet. And when it comes to my faith and to your faith, God wants to know that we truly love Him, not because we say it, but because we live it. He wants to experience it emotionally, even though He knows it intellectually. And so because Abraham was faithful in the trials, you know how the story ends, God stops Abraham. We read in Genesis 22, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. He called it Jehovah Jireh. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Abraham was in a real predicament. And Abraham used a powerful compound name for God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I want to conclude today by asking you this question. What is your Isaac? What one thing is God waiting for you to let go of so that you can truly experience His provision in your life? You know, Abraham really didn't experience the full provision of God, at least to the extent that God wanted him to experience it, until he was willing to let go of that one thing that he wanted so very badly until God knew that He was willing to even let go of His Son. If that's what God asked of Him to do, to be faithful. What is your Isaac? You know, it could be money. You may have a great job right now that pays you a handsome salary with great benefits, you may have a lot of influence in your workplace, but you know deep down, and the Lord certainly knows, that that job is not good for your faith. Because that job requires you to do some things that the Lord does not approve of. Do you have the faith to let go of that job if it means that you will better follow after God? Could that job be your Isaac? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you are dating someone that you know is not going to lead you closer to Jesus, but you love them so much. You have such a good time together, but they don't do anything for you spiritually. Do you have the faith to walk away from that relationship, to let it go and trust that the Lord will provide exactly what you need in your life? Maybe a friendship that falls into the same category. It may be your confidence in a president or your confidence in legislation. 
maybe your own children. That doesn't mean you need to be an absentee parent, but it does mean that your grown child is requiring so much of you that you can't give God what God deserves in your life. Are you going to be able to give God the place that He rightly deserves? Not just a place, but the place. Number one, what is your Isaac? We all have one. And Abraham experienced the full provision of God after he was willing to let Isaac go, not before. And Isaac, and what happens after this episode with Isaac in Genesis 22, is just the beginning of a mammoth blessing of God. We cannot truly experience the provision of God until we trust God to provide when His provision is the only thing that will get us through. God says, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, then I will surely bless you. And I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Friends, there are blessings from God that you have not experienced yet that will absolutely blow your mind, but you won't experience them until you have the faith to let go and to let God and to fully experience His provision. Can you do that? Do you have that faith? It may take a life to answer that question, but it is a question that we must all answer. I pray God's richest blessings on you this week. Thank you again for tuning in, and I hope that you will join us next time as we look at another compound name of God. God bless, and have a great week. Oh, praise the name of the Lord.